who just waltzed through life, okay? Peruvian Air Force commander, Anthony Choi, Peruvian Air Force, uh, uh, with the Air Force as a civilian member of the Air Anom running the Air Anomalous or Anomalous Air Phenomenal <laughs> Investigations, uh, a UK pilot, a Nick Pope, we talked about earlier from the UK Minister of Defense, and then two of the key witnesses from the Bent Waters, uh, Rendlesham Forest case in the UK, one of the most important events. And then John Callahan, we mentioned him in Five Simon. That's a pretty impressive group of listeners. This is what I mean, all right? Look, if PRG had the money, I could get 20 of those people hold the same thing myself. Might just do it, but uh, not, not, can't do that now. Now, this is those witnesses, right? This is Nick Pope. That is James Fox, the documentarist, right? This is Leslie Kane, the director of research for the a Coalition for Freedom of Information. Remember her. And they are responsible for this event. It was handled very well. It was a quality event, all good. Uh, so uh, now we move on to the last pressure, and this is the big one, and one of the reasons why I'm here. What has happened, quite simply, is that the United States got the World War II allies to go along with the truth embargo in 47. It was not hard to do. Who, who, why not? I mean, we were, we were extremely critical to the success in Europe. We clearly were the key to the success in Japan, and we were the only nation in the world capable of standing up to the Soviet Union. So if the United States comes to you for a favor in 1947, you're going to say no, okay? So they went along with it. Plus, it was probably, a, in their mind, a good decision. That cooperation solidified over time, but I think the understanding was always when the Cold War ends, well, we're going to get on with civilization, all right? Well, the Cold War ended, and we didn't. And so nine years after the Cold War has ended and still no disclosure, other nations started getting impatient. And the first nation to break ranks was France. And what France did, it's rather, rather cool, there was a committee called the Cometa Committee, right? Committee for In-Depth Studies. And they went ahead and did a, did a study on the UFO issue and issued a report. And it was made clear by the parties involved that this wasn't a French government report, all right? This is an unofficial you know, report, you know, like some college kids had put it together. You know, it was kind of like a, a project. So it wasn't a slap to the face of the United States by, you know, the French government, right? Meaning, why don't you disclose? What is your problem? Diplomatically a wise move. Now, let's look at the people that were on the committee, this non-governmental, non-official committee that did this report. Let's take a quick look at it here. Let's see what we've got. Okay. Here's the committee committee. It's made up of French Air Force General Dennis Leddy, he chaired, Air Force General Bruno Le Mans, Air Force, a Navy Admiral, French Navy Admiral Marc Merleau, and these are, most of these are members of the Institute for Advanced National Defense Studies, you know, one of those super think tanks. Then, of course, Michael Algren, a government attorney, John, Jean Douglas, a engineering, uh, uh, an engineer, Pierre Bescon, a weapons engineer, right? Not a lot of civilian versions of that. Dennis Blancher, the chief of the National Police and superintendent of the Ministry of the Interior. Nothing official about that. Then we have Christian Marshall, a chief mining engineer and director of the National Office of Aeronautical Research, and Alain Orzad, an armaments engineer and Francois Lepon at Foundation for Defense Studies. Not, like, not an official committee or anything like that. Okay. So what did they do? They published a report in 2000 in French, didn't promote it in the United States, they allowed it to be published in a magazine there. The name escapes me. Somebody probably knows. The U.S. didn't cover it, didn't care. Leslie Kane, though, wrote an article about it that got some exposure in the National, in the uh, Boston Globe, one of her early contributions. It's on the Internet. The point was it was a message to the United States government. It wasn't a question of promoting it to the American people. Now, how do we know it was a message to the United States government? Simple. In the end of the report are a couple of key conclusions. Let's take a look. They concluded that a single hypothesis sufficiently takes into account the facts and for the most part only calls for present day science. It is a hypothesis of extraterrestrial visitors. The French government just unofficially indicated that the ETs are real and got on board the disclosure train without creating a diplomatic incident. But they went further because here, they, in, in another section later on, they discussed the American U.S. policy. Thus, it would appear natural that in the mind of the U.S. military leader, secrecy must be maintained as long as possible. Secrecy about what? Right? Only, interesting pre only increasing pressure from the public opinion were doing that. 
possibly supported by the results of independent researchers, were doing that, by more or less calculated disclosures, were doing that, or by a sudden rise in UFO manifestations, oh, is that happening, might perhaps induce U.S. leaders and persons of authority to change their stance. From what? Well, the stance is that there is no phenomena to investigate. Therefore, if they're going to change their stance, it would be that there is a phenomena. It is real. So this is, this is France basically saying, you know, you Americans, you're always you know, trying to get first. We would like to be first one day, okay? By the way, a year later, because the French wouldn't cooperate with the coalition of the willing, we renamed the French fries in the congressional uh, cafeteria Freedom Fries. Okay? <laughs> Thus confirming what these people were trying to accomplish. Okay? So, the floodgates open, right? And it starts. Now, a lot of people don't know this because they're not paying attention. That's my job. My job is to pay attention so you can go about your lives and, 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 and not have to deal with this too much. In 2004, Mexico holds a big press conference in Mexico City and indicates it's going to cooperate with the UFO organization and release film from an interesting event that occurred during a drug surveillance. Well, the, the event was probably oil flares off the coast of Mexico and the oil rigs, but there's no way the Mexican Air Force holds a press conference like that in Mexico City without the Minister of Mexican Defense saying okay and Vincente Fox. This was a message to the United States saying, come on, We've got ETs all over the place here since 1991, right? 5,000 videos have been turned into Jaime Mousson. Would you please get on with it? Now, this happens a lot uh, between countries. Two years later, Mexico uh, let it be known in the media that it was seriously considering legalizing heroin. Now, they didn't legalize heroin, but that was a <coughs> message to the U.S. saying, your drug war is destroying us down here, right? Why don't you change your policy? So, message sent. 2005, former Deputy Prime Minister of Canada and Defense Minister during the Vietnam War, Paul Hellyer, goes, in a, goes to a symposium in Toronto and says he is convinced the ET presence is real. All right? And he's confirmed that with some of his contacts in the U.S. military. The next year, Canada starts releasing its UFO files to the Internet. Brazil jumps on board the disclosure train in 2005 as well when the Brazilian Air Force happens to announce in a cooperation with A.J. Gavard's group down there, that it's going to cooperate and start releasing records to them. It makes a big splash. Couldn't have been done without the president of Brazil saying it was okay. And then they started releasing their UFO files in 2006, and another batch of files just turned up, about 1,200, just a few days ago, about, well, actually a little bit more than that, uh, a couple months ago. And not directly from the government, but a lot of government files coming from an independent researcher suddenly turned over to AJ's group. Brazil, Brazil is on the disclosure train, and they've got the Olympics in 2016. Australia jumps on in 2007, starts releasing its UFO files, and then France drops the other shoe, whatever that is in French, in 2007 when it launches and opens up its files in a big way and puts them out on the internet, and the site crashes within, I don't know, 20 minutes. Boom, all right? All over the world. So far, millions, and how many million, we don't know, but millions of these files from these releases have already been downloaded throughout the world and are being looked at by countless people, right? Uh, then Denmark, hello, releases its files, starts releasing its files in 2009, early this year. Thank you very much, all right? And, uh, and, and you beat Sweden, by the way. Uruguay jumps on board a little later, 2009. There's some cases down there. Good old Uruguay, we're pleased at that. Then Sweden, interesting enough, Sweden, uh, all of Scandinavia has a good relationship with the United States, Sweden particularly. They don't want to embarrass it. And so what happens here is that the Sw Sw UFO Sweden makes the decision to release 60,000 uh, pages of documents, the largest files ever released, but it's a private deal. It's not the Swedish government. Okay, no problem. But we contacted the head of UFO Sweden, and he emphasized this is not the government, this is not the Swedish government, but did confirm that UFO Sweden has a copy of all of the Swedish government UFO files, which I assume they got from the Swedish government. So this is a nice way of Sweden saying, US, we are on the disclosure train. And then, in July of this year, a big surprise. The Russian Navy, out of nowhere, announces that 
we're going to release our underwater or water-based UFO files from the Russian Navy. Okay. These are files where the Navy has seen them coming in the water and coming out of the water and then traveling underwater at 200 miles an hour. Okay. Let me repeat that. Traveling underwater at 200 miles an hour. Do you have any idea what the pressure would be on the hull of a craft doing 200 miles underwater? You can't imagine. Okay. So uh, these are in the process of being released. Uh, then, what? Well, that gives you a picture of the, uh, the situation regarding other nations. Now, in fin Finland, Sweden, and Denmark have got files out. Finland and Norway don't. Ole Pajula is the head of uh, uh, Exopolitics Finland. And they're going to be doing some things there, okay? See if we can't get Finland on board. Norway, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, that, the Exopolitics Norway, which will be up soon. That side will be up soon, by the way. I'll, I'll give us 23, 24 nations. Is Kim Stensball. And uh, they're going to start seeing what they can do in Sweden. We'd love to have all four of the Scandinavian countries releasing some files, okay, without, you know, being too ostentatious about it. A at this time, we, we already have Denmark, Sweden, and Finland in, uh, and we will have, so we will have all four Scandinavian nations in the exopolitics world network very soon, which is very cool. Okay, now, hmm. now, let's get, now, now we're getting down to the, the real hard stuff, okay. All of this is designed to, to convince you that, ex that the, the disclosure event is, is going to happen. Now I'm going to try to explain to you how it's going to happen and or at least some of the processes that are taking place. From this point forward, you want to think about this as a chess game that's being played between the activist movement, whatever or wherever it is, and the United States government primarily. Right? There are some things happening in other countries, France, UK, what have you, but the, the game is primarily being played. And for most of the last 60 years, the government had all the pieces, lots of pieces, right? And lots of money, lots of power, and they did quite well. Uh, we weren't making any progress. But in the last uh, 10 years, we got pieces on our side, right? Particularly the internet. And uh, the media is starting to come around, and so we started to make progress, and now we are pushing their pieces back on the board and knocking out some pieces. And so we're heading towards what I would refer to in chess as mate in three, to put the government in a position where it has nowhere to go and it must disclose, right? Preferably not waiting to actually be mated, but rather to proactively end the game to disclose and, and look good doing it. The key piece on the board for us right now is this, the Rockefeller Initiative. And I'm gonna go through this pretty quickly. But this is a very historical thing, and it will be so seen in the future. Uh, and it is the linchpin to the political process underway and the advocacy. I'm going to go through it as quickly as possible because, again, I'm, I'm squeezing about four hours into, into two tonight. Uh, very quickly. Lawrence Rockefeller, not David, not J.D. This is one of the brothers but not like the other brothers. This, this is a man, very advanced thinking, out of the box. He, he funded crop circle work, paranormal work. Uh, he, 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 he funded uh, uh, John Mack, uh, and he was interested in, in uh, a lot of these issues, and I think he was interested in open government. Um, he made the decision that whoever won the 1992 election, he was going to approach them formally to start a process which would lead to disclosure. Right? He didn't care who it was, Ross Perot, Bill Clinton, or George H.W. Bush. Bill Clinton won, and so on March, Lawrence Rockefeller's attorney approached the Clinton administration via John Gibbons, the head of the science office in the, in the executive branch, about meeting with the president, providing a report to the president, and a number of other things that he wanted to do. In other words, he was going to move the disclosure process forward. Uh, and thus began the Rockefeller Initiative that lasted for almost three years. Um, very quickly, the, uh, most of the material, the key researcher here is Grant Cameron out of Winnipeg, Canada. It's a website, presidentialufo.com, the largest archive of information about U.S. presidents and UFOs in the world. Check out the Clinton section, you'll see the narratives. I also have a very large section on my site. But Grant is the man that's done all the hard work. He is not an activist, he is a researcher. 
And that's a very important site. Uh, and one last thing. One of the reasons this thing is so solid and why it is a major piece on this chessboard is that in 2000, Grant Cameron filed a Freedom of Information Act demand of that science office that John Gibbons ran, asking for all documents related to Rockefeller, UFO saucers, disclosure, all that stuff. And somebody who's asleep at the switch, he got a thousand pages back, confirming everything. He made copies immediately, I got a set. We tried to give it to the press, they didn't see any news. No news here. So, uh, we had the basic documents confirming it all, and that, now that was, that was 2000. It's taken years to bring this to where we are now, still. These are the principles in the Rockefeller Initiative. These names are important, right? There's, there's a reason why the Rockefeller Initiative is important. Uh, first of all, um, Lawrence Rockefeller himself, billionaire son of John D., uh, his attorney, Henry Diamond, uh, the, his, uh, working for Rockefeller as the head of the Human Potential <laughs> Foundation, CB, Commander C.B. Scott Jones, former, Ar former Army Intelligence. An employee of, of uh, Jones is Richard Farley, a journalist. And then, of course, Dr. John Gibbons, the head of the Office of Science and Technology Policy, where the initiative essentially was centered. And there were two other principles you may know, this gentleman and this woman. All right? I say principles. They were involved in it. All right? They knew about it. They took actions. All right? News didn't cover it. No stories, no news, nothing. Okay. These are the secondary principles, people that were tangential to it, some more than others. This is an important secondary principle, Webster Hubble. Clinton asked him to look into the UFO issue of justice. He did. They indicted him for everything after that and sent him to jail. This is Melvin Laird. He is mentioned in the Rockefeller documents. He's the former Secretary of Defense. This is Claiborne Pell. He was a senator and very interested in the UFO phenomena and other matters. Patty Murray, the, the uh, senator, and also the Secretary of Air Force, Sheila Widnall. And then these are the watchers. These are the people that were almost principals, but as much as anything, they were watching it and reacting to it. The one really should be a principal. I need to change it. But I call them the watchers. They include Albert Gore, the vice president at the time of the Rockefeller Initiative, 91 to 93, went on to make energy and environmental reform a major part of his life and his legacy, and that is not an accident. John Podesta, the advisor to President Clinton during that period in the White House and his eventual chief of staff. Bill Richardson, close friend of the Clintons, currently a congressman, uh, presently a congressman at the time of the uh, Rockefeller Initiative, went on to become Clinton's Secretary of Energy and his ambassador to the UN, went on to run for president, now currently governor of New Mexico. Stephen Schiff, the uh, congressman from New Mexico, who as an adjunct of sort of that process, started looking into the Roswell records, trying to get the phone and paper records from that era to get to the bottom of it. Uh, he couldn't get anything. They ran, ran him around in circles. He got angry. He went on television. He went on Larry King. He complained about it uh, and made quite a bit of news. And then he got cancer of, I think, this earlobe, a kind of super duper squamous cancer. Uh, and they just couldn't stop it. And it killed him in about one year. Then, Liam Panetta, who was his chief of staff, chief of staff of Bill Clinton during the Rockefeller Initiative. These are the watchers. Okay. Very quickly, these are the researchers that were involved in the, the back and forth that went on in the studies and creation of books. They met at Rockefeller's ranch in Wyoming to plan their strategies, right? Some of them you may know. Don Berliner, Antonio Honeas, the late Richard Hall, uh, Robert Teets, the late Dr. John Mack, Dr. Leo Sprinkle, Dr. Stephen Greer, Dr. Bruce McAbee, Linda Milton Howe, Dr. Jacques Vallée, Colin Andrews, a uh, small part for Victoria Alexander, the wife of John Alexander, <coughs> Carl Flock, and Dr. Richard Boylan. Now, also, halfway through the Rockefeller Initiative, Bill and Hillary Clinton met with Lawrence Rockefeller at his ranch privately in Wyoming. We know this because of articles about it, such as the New York Times, confirming that the President and, his, and, and, and Hillary Clinton met him at the ranch. But, through FOIA requests, of the Clinton Library, we have gotten the photographs of them meeting on 1995. This is Hillary and Rockefeller. This is Bill and Rockefeller. And you can bet they were talking about the Rockefeller Initiative to end the UFO truth embargo on those get-togethers. All right? And then here's Bill Clinton and Lawrence Rockefeller 
later on uh, and toward the end of his presidency. Lawrence uh, uh, eventually uh, slid into sort of, I think, uh, Alzheimer's or something equivalent and dropped out of the processes. He was quite old, but he left a powerful legacy. Now, on my side, I have created a section devoted to this, which has all this information and all the people I just showed you, but it also has this. 173 of the most important Rockefeller Initiative documents in chronological order, so you can go and follow the whole thing right into late 1996. And of course, we've sent this link to the press repeatedly over the last three or four years, right? Let them know that they could go see this interesting story. And in those thousand pages are two extremely important documents. They're not smoking guns, but let's just say they may end up serving that purpose. These two. A document, November the 2nd, 1st, or the 2nd. This is a letter from Rockefeller's attorney, Henry Diamond, to Dr. John Gibbons of the science office of Bill Clinton. And in the very first sentence, he says this. Uh, attached are a draft letter to the president, which Lawrence has been uh, discussing with Mrs. Clinton and her staff, and a draft report of the best evidence about UFOs, confirming that First Lady Hillary Clinton was aware of and involved in the Rockefeller Initiative. All right? And then, in February uh, of 1996, another letter directly from um, Lawrence to Jack Gibbons, and in this paragraph, he says it may well be that it will be timely to put this before, meaning the report, uh, the President, late this year, in order that it might receive attention in his second term. I'm, I'm, I've in, uh, you indicated that you will keep the First Lady's office informed, and we shall as well. That's it. She's involved in the Rockefeller Initiative to end the UFO embargo during her, her husband's term as president. That's major, massive news. Never covered. Never touched. Okay. Now, now we jump ahead. All right. Bill Clinton serves out his presidency. He, he was not going to be the disclosure president. In fact, when, when Rockefeller turned up at his door, alarm bells were going off all over Washington, D.C. in the military intelligence community. Oh, my Lord, Bill Clinton could be the disclosure president. A draft-dodging, womanizing, pot-smoking bubba from Arkansas, right, who we despise. And he could be the disclosure president. And so guess what? A whole lot of money turned up in, you know, to found the Heritage Foundation and the American Enterprise Institute, backed by Richard Mellenscaife. Clear Channel Communications started cranking up the biggest right-wing radio network in all of history, and they hit him with everything they had. They hit him with mortar shells, cluster bombs. They, they tried to destroy Bill Clinton. Every kind of scandal, Pork Belly Gate, Trooper Gate, uh, Whitewater Gate, uh, Travel Gate, He's just too good a politician. They couldn't bring him down. And so they had to stretch it out for eight years. He loses, he, he leaves office. Gore should have been president, but Bill didn't help. And the, and, and the new president takes office after the U.S. Supreme Court gives him the election on a five to four vote. Okay? And one of the most god-awful elections ever in the history of the United States, I can assure you, I hope you've never had one like that. Uh, it was quite a time. And so, we enter the first decade of the 21st century, and things start happening very fast because I am convinced the Democrats, who knew disclosure was happening, they knew it was going to come. There are key people in the Democratic Party well aware that there's ex trusted presence, I can assure you, All right? made the decision that, okay, they yanked that legacy away from us during the Clinton years, but when we get back in power, we're going, to, we're going to disclose. We have big plans. We're going to shake this earth, right? And so how do we know this? Here's why. It starts in the summer of 2002. I get a phone call from a vice president for the Sci-Fi Channel that they're about to release in October the largest miniseries in all of history. Huge, $100 million, I think, created by Steven, uh, uh, produced by Steven Spielberg called Taken about abduction. And I think most of you know about this series. All right? And they called me because sci-fi wanted to give back to the American people uh, who they hoped would watch this miniseries by creating and putting their money into a Washington-based organization that would help move things along. 
Now, of course, I was thinking, why don't you give the money to me? I've been doing this for almost, uh, see, eight years now, seven years, right? Well, I'm a little too, how would you say, independent. So they wanted something more substantial, more basic. Okay, fine. So I gave them all, all the information I could. And in October, on October 22nd, the Sci-Fi Channel holds a press conference at the National Press Club to announce this new organization, right? And it's going to be called the Coalition for Freedom of Information. So I cruise on down to the National Press Club, you bet, to watch this press conference. And when I get there, the first person that walks in, to, uh, who walks up to the podium to speak, is this man, John Podesta. Remember him? He was the key advisor to Bill Clinton during the Rockefeller Initiative, all right? Bill Clinton actually asked him to help, at least not with UFOs, but to see what we could do to change the declassification procedures to try to get millions of more documents out to the American people, which John Podesta did, but no reference to UFOs. And so John turns up, and that's interesting, and then uh, uh, they announce a, a, a big shot public relations firm going to represent them, Podesta Mattoon. That's John's brother, right? So they're keeping it in the family here, all right? This is big time uh, operation. This is not trivial. And then a K Street uh, law firm, uh, Lobel, Nobles, and Lamont, to handle their cases. Wow, this was significant to me. And it got even more significant when John opened his mouth, okay? Because in, the, in, with, in, a, in a span of about two and a half minutes, John Podesta made some history, though nobody knew it at the time. Fully filmed by Sci Fi Channel with a couple of press. Uh, in the, uh, a couple of press showed up, wasn't many. In fact, one of them was the Socialist Workers Daily. He says this, I think it's time to open the books on the questions that have remained in, dark, in the dark on the question of government investigation of UFOs. We ought to do it because the American people, quite frankly, can handle the truth, and we ought to do it because it's the law. Now, understand what's just happened here. One of the key members of the democratic intellectual elite Former key advisor to Bill Clinton, former chief of staff to Bill Clinton, has just gone before a press conference in the National Press Club and called for the release of all UFO documents in October of 2002. And because we're living in the YouTube internet revolution, everything is recorded, everything remains. And so all over the web today, all over the world, people are downloading this and watching this 26 seconds. I will start it again. Hang on. I'm going to turn it up a little bit. This is an historic 26 seconds, folks. It may change the world. UFOs. It's time to find out what, what the truth really is that's out there. Uh, we ought to do it really because it's right. We ought to do it because the American people, quite frankly, can handle the truth. And we ought to do it because it's the law. I think it's time to open the So my jaw fell right to the floor. I couldn't believe it. I assumed that the Republicans would descend on him and chop him up throw them in a tree mulcher and turn them into chips, spread them over somebody's lawn. Because politics in the United States for the last 15 years has been a blood sport. Everybody's carrying chainsaws. Make a mistake, you're finished. You're done. So I assumed that they were going to destroy him. They never touched him. They never said a thing. They left him completely alone. Well, a year goes by and the coalition comes back with another press conference, October 23, 2003. And they're going to sort of update the, the world on what's going on. And I went to that. They had even more press there this time. And in walks John Podesta and says basically the same thing, including these words. It is time for the government to declassify records that are more than 25 years old and to provide scientists with data that will assist in determining the real nature of this phenomenon. All right. John Podesta has gone on record basically that the Democrats are going to disclose. That's really what's going on here. Now, it gets better. In addition to not being touched for that 
for the year between those two press conferences by his enemies in the Democratic and the Republican Party, right, at a time when partisanship was rank. John Podesta goes out in that 12 months and raises $25 million to found a brand new think tank, which he announced 13 days after he called for the release of the UFO documents in 2003. It was, it is, was and, and is the Center for American Progress, a, a progressive think tank created to offset the growing influence of the American Enterprise Institute and the Heritage Foundation. Now, the biggest contrib contributor to the 25 million was this man, interestingly enough, George Soros, arbitrager, made a fortune in currency arbitrage. He eventually, by 2005, was the 28th richest person in the world, he was also the largest single donor to the Democratic National Committee, all right? And George Soros, who was, who along with his family, escaped the Nazi tyranny in Hungary by fleeing to the West, once he became wealthy, made his number one issue, his key issue in his life, this issue. Does this sound familiar? Open, transparent government. He spent millions of dollars creating open government groups around the world. And he is the backer of John Podesta, who has called for the release of the UFO documents. But it gets better because approximately uh, seven months later, this guy, remember him? Yeah. One of the watchers, friend of the Clintons. He writes a foreword to a book called The Roswell Dick Donovan. <coughs> and in this foreword, in print, can't take it back, the mystery surrounding this crash at Roswell has never been adequately explained. I beg to differ. The Air Force says it has explained it completely, and the case is closed, not according to the government of New Mexico, and not by independent investigators, and not by the U.S. government. It would help everyone if the U.S. government disclosed everything it knows. With full disclosure and our best scientific investigation, we should be able to find out what happened on that fateful day in July of 47. The American people can handle the truth. Does that sound familiar? no matter how bizarre or mundane and contrary to what you see in the movies. He wrote this knowing full well he was going to run for president of the United States and was always a top pick to be vice presidential candidate and wrote it anyway. All right, And we're in the summer of 2004, but it gets better because a few months later, at the same National Press Club, a coalition of left of center groups, including unions and teachers and, and think tanks and John Podesta, turn up at the National Press Club to announce a major new program, which clearly was going to be part of the, the new Democratic administration in 2005, that was going to bring America, which was already in deep trouble by 2004, right? Trust me on this. It's amazing how we managed to dig the hole deeper, but it was already pretty deep. It was going to change everything, and I was down there. What was it? It was called the New Apollo Project, right? And it was, it was grand. Multi-hundred billion dollar FDR, New Deal, resurgence, rebirth program for the United States based not on building roads and, and chopping down trees like in the 1930s, but based on a massive green technology development renaissance. Every green tech advanced and developed brand new ideas developed from scratch creating hundreds of thousands of science and engineering jobs, technology to be manufactured in the U.S. by law, hired U.S. first by law, licensing it out to the rest of the world, turning around our balance of payments, giving it away free to the third world, raising our esteem, and completely turning America around. An unbelievable program. And as I sat there in that room that day, I said, I know exactly what they intend to do. They're going to win the election in November of 2004. They're going to come into office. This would be John Kerry. They're going to announce the new Apollo project. They're going to get that sold. They're going to start you know, the process of moving into the green technology revolution. And then they're going to disclose the ET presence and announce the ACE in the hole. And the ACE stands for A, and the A stands for aliens, right? And I am referring to, right? By the way, this is Hillary Clinton standing in front of the Apollo Alliance so sticker here. I'm referring to this. This is what, for the vast majority of the human race, it is all about. 
Okay, this. All right, 6.3 billion people, of which 2 billion are living in poverty, okay, with enough dissent and dissatisfaction to drive endless terrorism indefinitely into the future. With 25,000 children dying every day from malnutrition, lack of food and water, 25,000 a day per day. Well, it, with the bad weather, it goes up to 30,000. Okay. This is what saves us. This is what we have to have. With the Antarctic ice cap melting, with the tundra getting ready to melt, with global warming and holes in the ozone, right? We have to have this technology. We need the physics that makes these saucers work the anti-gravitic drive, the anti-gravitic propulsion, and the energy system that powers the craft. And guess what? The U.S. government has had these craft, at least one, maybe four or five, in its, in its laboratories under development with hundreds of billions of dollars for 60 years. But it's not available to us at all. Only for weapons or whatever else they have in mind. This technology could turn the 21st century from a nightmare into a blessing very fast. But we can't have it because the truth embargo is in place. All right? But the Democrats, you see, had plans. You put a new Apollo project in place, you commit the money to green tech, you bring out that ET technology, and I'm telling you, there won't be a Republican in power until the 20, to the, to the third millennium, the fourth millennium. All right? This would have been massive. And I'm going, whoa, hello, let's party. And the Democrats were certain they were going to win because they were signing up voters like crazy. All right? George Bush was having a rough time. His administration was not going all that well. And so consequently, they were just signing up the voters and they were thinking, we got this. Mm -hmm. Well, the Republicans are not fools. They play the game well and hard. And so what the Republican did, and this was Karl Rove, they made a decision to try to go out and sign up millions of new voters based upon an issue. They needed a major issue, something incredibly powerful, incredibly important, that would galvanize millions of people to sign up to the Republican Party. And they found it. Gay marriage. And using that issue, they signed up millions of people and won the election in Ohio. Some think it was stolen. And George Bush won, and the Democrats lost. And what happened, of course, is that everybody stopped talking about ETs and UFOs and releasing documents. And the, Rock and, the, uh, and the Apollo project was shelved and stuck at a website called the ApolloAlliance.org, where it remains today. Whenever you hear about green tech and environmental jobs, it's all, this is what it's at. And there's a reason why this has not re-emerged to become the new Apollo project, right? Because there's some serious hardball being played in the United States, okay? It's bloody. It's vicious. It's as ugly as it gets. Hope you never see it as long as you live. But I live with it day in and day out. All right? And so essentially, they lose the election. They shut up. They've got to go through four more years before they can get back in power. But they are determined to get back in power because this will be a legacy that will change the world. And so with that in mind, we're approaching the 2008 election. All right? But other things are going on around the world. Remember, this is not just about a couple of political parties. You've got a vast array of things happening, and things start picking up so fast. And you could feel the rush to the finish line. It's like running a, anybody run a marathon ever? <coughs> a marathon? I used to, believe it or not. At the last mile, you see the finish line up there, and boy, you just, here's what starts happening. We'll pick it up in January of 2007. There's a major signing over the Chicago O'Hare Airport. Saucer right over the runway, seen by ground crew pilots, people in the, in the airport terminal, right? The thing then shoots straight up through the clouds, leaving a big hole. When the government is contacted, he said, it was nothing there, nothing there. Until so many pilots came forward, the government said, okay, there was something there. That was it. Big news story, though. Went on for weeks, right? Significant event. And before that news cycle could end, in March, this is when Symington is interviewed, and it becomes publicly known that he saw that craft that night in Arizona and is convinced it's extraterrestrial. And then in the same month is when the French start releasing <coughs> their major release of UFO files. And then two months later, the UK starts releasing its UFO files. And then in June is when the CIA releases the crown jewels. Shocking. Nobody saw it coming. 
It's not about UFOs. The crown jewels are a bunch of files in the CIA that everybody knew existed that referred to a whole bunch of naughtiness that the CIA had been involved in, unpleasantness, as you might say, and suddenly they just released them all to the public, you know? So, sort of, oh, here we are, mea culpa, all right? Noted that with great interest. Then in October is when Dennis Kucinich and Bill Richardson were asked UFO questions at the October 30 debate, Democratic debate in Philadelphia. I've got the tape on that. We may or may not have time to see it, but it was a pretty significant thing. Tim Russert asked the first question, and, 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 and uh, um, Chris Matthews asked Richardson a question after the debate, and boy, that's some pretty fascinating video. And then the CFI press conference that I referred to with the witnesses in, in November, and then in December of 07 is when a member of the Japanese cabinet just happened to mention during uh, a film discussion that ETs were clearly here, which caught the news by surprise and created quite a, uh, quite a, uh, a flap there until the, uh, the prime minister himself had to step in and calm things down. Then in January is the Stephenville sighting, Stephenville, Texas. Several craft moving at high speed being chased by four F-16s of the United States Air Force heading right for the president's ranch post 9-1-1. That should have launched a major national response with planes flying all over the place. In fact, when the Air Force was asked about this, they said there were no jets in the sky that night. Well, so many people in Stephenville, Texas saw this, they got really irritated and they started beating on the Air Force until finally it said, okay, we had jets up that night, okay. Major sighting, still going on, all kinds of implications, radar data. That happens in January, and then in May is when uh, 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 the Denver ballot initiative by Jeff Peckman gets a whole lot of press in the United States and sends Jeff right up to the David Letterman show. A lot of national exposure and a very nice news cycle. And then the same month is when, one morning, the head Vatican astronomer, Gabriel Funes, Father Gabriel Funes, gets up, decides to hold a press conference, and announced to the press that he, the head astronomer of the Vatican, wants to make it clear that the Vatican has no problem whatsoever with extraterrestrials. They would be brothers under God in a larger world by God. Whoa, really cool. Following up what Corrado Balducci was saying in the 90s, out of nowhere, the Vatican is totally ready for this, they have been for some time. And then in July is when Larry King, who had done many UFO shows on CNN, starts doing a lot of them. One, two, three, four, five, with four, five, six witnesses at a time. Uh, Larry is on our side. And then in July, is that same month, Dr. Edgar Mitchell, we talked about him, comes over, I mean, gives a radio interview in the United Kingdom on Kerrang! Radio, right? To an audience is mostly Gen Xers, young Gen Xers, and some millennials, meaning kids that are coming of age at the turn of the century. And, and, and repeats what he's been saying for 10 years, that, that I'm convinced that ETs are here, and that Roswell was a real crash, etc. But these, these kids were hearing it for the first time, so whoa, they got really worked up. And the head, the head of the show, Nick Margerison, the host, did a smart move. He released an after-interview press release to the public. Now, Kerrang! Radio is, is owned by a very big German company called Bauer Consumer. So when Bauer puts out a press release, people listen. And so it made a huge news cycle. Edgar got 200 media requests for interviews. He could only handle 50. Did about eight or nine uh, television interviews, right? And it generated a huge news cycle on this issue, all right? It brought a tremendous amount of exposure to the radio show and increased their ratings, which is why, of course, three months later, they canceled the show. Then, in October, you got the UK UFO files release. Followed by, the, uh, uh, followed by actions by uh, President Obama in January uh, of 2009, uh, where he signs two presidential memorandums and a presidential order. The presidential order reverses the action by George Bush to restrict the Presidential Records Act, uh, which he did as soon as he became president in, in, uh, in 2001. Uh, making it more difficult to get records from the, from the pre previous presidents, libraries. We think it was to protect the UFO files under Reagan and George H.W. Bush. In any event, uh, Obama signs a directive reversing that order, and then he signs a memorandum calling for all of the agencies in his government to start operating in an open, transparent fashion. 
and then he signs a presidential memorandum calling for reform of the Freedom of Information Act, which is one of the key tools that we've been using, but it's, it's, it's been in, it balanced in favor of the government. He wants to make it in our favor. Then in July, t t uh, July 09 is when the Russians release their files, and then the UK does another file release in, in August, followed by the Brazil release in August. And then in September of this year, the, J the Japanese first lady, brand new first lady, writes a book and announces that she's been involved in the UFO issue and she, she has dreams about being taken to Venus by extraterrestrials. Creates quite a news cycle, let me tell you. She's gonna be around for a long time. Her husband is very, very popular. And then a major sighting in China, followed by an eclipse in China at which a very significant uh, event takes place. A craft is seen, an object by millions of Chinese, and then it's announced on Chinese media certainly with the approval of the Chinese Communist Party, that the Purple Mountain, at least Purple Mountain Observatory, one of their official astronomical observatories, filmed the whole thing, 40 minutes, on high optical cameras, and that the Chinese government will be studying it, you see. Uh, then Obama, uh, in September, abandons the, the anti-ballistic missile system in Europe and Poland. This is a huge deal. Uh, people are still digesting this. I think it's connected. Uh, then in Obama, and then the last thing is, just, just a few weeks ago, Obama begins uh, and announces an intent to reform the United States Secrets Act. This is a very big deal. The United States Secrets Act is, some, most countries have something like this, particularly the UK, is what protects the government from litigation. So if you get run over by a home bee, all right, and you want to sue the government for like $10 million, all the government has to do is say, that Humvee was involved in a very secret project all right, that has to do with national security. And under the State Secrets Act, you can't sue us. He wants to reform this so you can. And that doesn't just include getting run over by a Humvee. You want to sue the government over the truth embargo? This makes it easier to do that. This is a major move. Not, not a big splash, hasn't gotten a lot of attention. So you see just in two years how fast things are moving, move, maneuvers that are being made. Because understand, the administration can't even hint that it's going to disclose. It can't send up a trial balloon. It's got to do what it's going to do very discreetly, and then when it acts, it will act very quickly. Now, uh, skip this. This is like, you know, some presidents were brief, some presidents weren't. Uh, that's a long story. I could tell you a lot about that, but let's get to these two guys. This is an important point. If you had to look for one reason why the U.S. government hasn't disclosed since George H.W. Bush, who would have been okay as the disclosure president, uh, was in office, it would be because of these two gentlemen. To make a long story short, the military intelligence committees that manage the UFO ET issue from deep down within the black world, the secret empire, the ones that call the shots on this, the ones the president doesn't even know who they are, right? Had in no way were they going to allow this man or this man to be the disclosure president. It's extremely important to them that who 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 was president at disclosure time, because they have certain concerns and needs. They're very worried about the aftermath of disclosure. They want the, the national security to be protected. They need a president they can work with, and and to make and to be very brief about it. As far as they were concerned, this man was not moral enough to be the disclosure president, and this man was not smart enough to be the disclosure president. And there is much more to this than that, but I assure you, they were not going to let it happen unless, you know, the saucers come down or China announces or something like that. So that pushed the disclosure out 16 years, but of course, now we have this man. And very quickly, when he is elected, the first thing I'm looking for is show me the indications that, that I'm right about this. Show me the clues, the hints, that in fact the, the, the Democrats are going to disclose the ET presence. And, and that will help to assure that, we, I have, that the theory is correct. And boy, did the, did the hints and clues turn up right away, all right? First and foremost, let's, let's do some comparisons here. Oh, but first, of, first of all, let me mention, in case you hadn't forgotten, he makes this one of the key themes of his campaign, open, transparent government. Still talks about it. Remember, that's the, the life's work of George Soros, the backer of John Podesta. 
Okay, so we got that, good. But then, it's, uh, it's time, he's, he's, he's been elected, right? He's been elected, or he, he's been elected November 5. And so, let's do a little comparison. Rockefeller Initiative, key advisor to Clinton, John Podesta, came out and called for the release of UFO records not once, but twice. In fact, he also did it in a documentary that was, was created by the Sci-Fi Channel. So naturally, Barack Obama selected him as the co-chair of his transition team, the key person who helps to plan the opening days of the administration and select other personnel, a major position. Huge indication that Obama or the Democrats plan to disclose. And then we have this lady, remember? First lady, involved in it, briefed on it, knew about it, met with Rockefeller up at his ranch, totally implicated, we got the documents to prove it. What happens to her? Well, as we know, she becomes Secretary of State, probably with the, uh, the uh, assistance of, of John Podesta. And then we've got this guy, remember him? Bill, uh, Bill Richardson calls for the release of the Roswell documents. All right. What happens to him? Well, they nominate him Secretary of Commerce, which has got key uh, roles in a lot of areas that relate to national defense and energy and other things. He had to step away over a legal issue that would have affected his nomination process, but ne nevertheless, they nominated him. Then we got this person. That was the chief of staff to Bill Clinton during the Rockefeller Initiative. The chief of staff is considered the second most powerful person in the United States. Knows everything going on in the executive branch, controls the traffic in and to the president, documents, people, everything, all right? So what happened to Leon Panetta? Did he retire? Did he move to Barbados? No, they made him the head of the CIA, of course, right? Are you getting the picture here? Yeah. Is it starting to line up? And there's other clues because, for instance, there are other positions of importance. And oh, by the way, let's not forget Bill. Bill didn't retire. He didn't go away. Bill is still a big player in the Democratic Party, envoy to North, envoy to North Korea. Of course, he's the wife's uh, husband, the Secretary of State. Uh, he ain't going away. Why? Because Bill wants a piece of that disclosure legacy that was denied him by the right and by the military intelligence community when he was president. And so he's still around and still a big shot. But then, this was important. We knew that Obama, if he was going to be the disclosure president, they had to select people for the key national security positions that would appease and appeal to the military intelligence community. Otherwise, they were not going to want to play ball with Obama. Do we see that in his selections? Well, let's check him out. Let's see. Bush appointed as his national security advisor an academic concert pianist. All right? Obama selected a Marine Commandant General James Jones. Hard-nosed, all right? Then we got the uh, Secretary of Energy, right? Key post, particularly. Remember that ET energy issue? Remember the ET tech issue? Uh, uh, Bush, uh, at the end of his term, had this gentleman, the Secretary of Energy, uh, Samuel Bodman, whose previous job was in mutual funds, okay? And uh, you know, that, that, that uh, financial uh, investment banking thing that's worked out so well for the United States. Who did, uh, who did Obama pick? Well, naturally, he picked a Nobel Prize physicist with an emphasis in plasma physics. Interesting, huh? And then we've got, well, the Director of Office of Science and Technology Policy. Remember on the Rockefeller Initiative, that was John Gibbons, right? Right, totally appropriate, physics guy. Who would Obama pick? No problem, he picks another physics guy from Harvard, John Holden, with an emphasis in energy. And then, to wrap it up, to appease the military intelligence community, he keeps Secretary Gates in, in, in the Department of Defense, a very well-respected guy, gets the job done. You may not like the job, but he gets it done. And then he brings in a naval admiral to be his director of national intelligence and the boss of Leon Panetta. All right? This is the disclosure team, folks. The odds of that team being assembled in, based upon the advanced anticipation of the people needed to be in the disclosure team and having it match up like that are millions to one. Obama had thousands of people he could have picked. Any of them would have served under him. The guy came in with a popular, popularity rating of about 90% or something like that. And so he picks these people. So, to finish this up, it comes down to this. Paradigm Research Group and its colleagues, knowing that the game is reaching the end, knowing that we have a window of opportunity, and knowing what's at stake, 
have done what we could to ensure that we get this happening as soon as possible now while we have a chance. So, the planning for factsonwashington.org starts in July of 1997. Two fundamental initial goals. Expand the exopolitical network worldwide and force the UFO issue into that presidential campaign which everybody knew was going to be the longest in history and the most expensive in American history. And we did that. We did both of those things. Setting the stage for the new president to be elected on November the 5th, which is when we launched the Facts on Washington. All right? And based on information found there, people started sending letters, faxes, and emails to the new president-elect at the transition headquarters. Thousands of them came in from all over the world. I mean, it's an international uh, deal, right? I did something like 100 radio shows publicizing this, thousands of press releases. And so between November the 5th and Inauguration Day, the letters poured in. Then, that was phase one. Phase two started on Inauguration Day. He becomes president January 20th. So at that point, we moved the target to the White House, and all the mail and correspondence was started going to President Obama, care of the White House, facts, letters, emails, all right? Calling for the talking points at that website, facts in Washington. What are they? The president will demand full briefings. The president will call for congressional hearings. The president will grant amnesty to witnesses coming forward. The president will release the UFO ET technology. The president will disclose the extraterrestrial presence letter after fax after email, hoping he would disclose in the first 130 days of the term. But he didn't. And so we went to phase three, the final phase of this whole little chess maneuver, right? The final phase, and this phase will continue until disclosure takes place. Based on new information at factsonwashington.org, we moved the target from the White House to the press briefing room in the West Wing. This is where those reporters sit five days a week asking questions of the president's press secretary, Robert Gibbs. It sits over the old swimming pool, and a lot of these the reporters have their offices down in the swimming pool. It's kind of fun. I've been there many times, all right? And guess what? They have never asked a UFO ET question of anybody in that room, as far as I know, ever, all right? It's just not, it's not done. It's part of the truth embargo. Everybody knows that. And so, Thousands of letters, faxes, and emails have been going to these fine people, care of their White House Correspondents Association, calling for them to start asking the right questions and demanding appropriate answers. And at the site, we have 13 key questions there. And why is that important? Because you see most of these questions hook back to the Rockefeller Initiative and Clinton and Panetta and Clinton and Richardson and Podesta powerful people in the new administration of the most powerful nation in the world hooked to the Rockefeller Initiative by documents completely confirmed and on the internet. It is a, it's a locked deal. It's a no-brainer. And we put the, the links on the site to all of the documents and the photos and the supporting material confirming the whole thing. We made it so easy for them. And so all we need is a couple of these reporters to finally say enough is enough. I want my Pulitzer Prize and start asking a few questions. If that happens, the truth embargo will probably be over inside of three weeks. That's facts on Washington, phase three. So, we made the motto of this, almost done. This, our republic and its press will rise or fall together. Starting in 1963, I believe it was, when the uh, President of the United States, Johnson, sold to Congress a bill of goods on the Gulf of Tonkin lies about an attack in a North Korean Gulf that opened up the expansion of the Vietnam War. The press let us down and fell at that point and have been falling ever since and our country is going with them. And if you're not paying attention, you may miss us as we disappear completely out of sight because things are going really bad back there. Uh, and I tell you, Scandinavia is looking awful good. Right? All the way across, I'm going, hmm, this is a nice place. Ooh, I'd like to live here. The United States is in big trouble, folks, because the press let us down. And so I've made this the motto. It comes from a plaque. It's the first sentence of a plaque given to the White House, I mean, to the National Press Club, where all those press conferences were held, by the, the uh, uh, Columbia School of Journalism on their 50th anniversary, right? And the quote is from Joseph Pulitzer the founder of the Columbia School of Journalism and Modern Journalism in America. All right? 
Our republic or its press will rise or fall together. And that's why on April the 20th, right, leading into the phase three at this, this building, the National Press Club, where that plaque resides, we held a press conference of which I have, I have uh, about four or five DVDs there of this press conference, still there, it's about an hour and 20 minutes. And at this press conference, this man, Edgar Mitchell, for the first time went in front of the media, including CNN, which live streamed the entire press conference worldwide, and called for the Obama administration to end the truth embargo and release all the files. And he was followed by this man, Milton Torres, right? Who in 1957, when he looked like that, was ordered by the UK government while serving as an Air, US Air Force pilot in the UK to fly out over the channel and investigate a UFO in the pea soup fog. I guess they didn't want to send a Brit, so they sent a Yank. And so off he went. And as he started to get within firing range of this object, he was ordered by the UK government to shoot it down, which really upset him greatly. It's possible this may have been connected to the situation regarding the U-2 shoot down of Gary Powers in Russia. I need to confirm this, and I'll be working on that. But this man was not happy. And the reason he wasn't happy is because about that time, the radar return started coming back on this, this quote, craft and it was the size of an aircraft carrier. So he had just been ordered to shoot down a flying aircraft carrier. So he was very upset. Fortunately, suddenly the aircraft carrier started doing that, right? And then, boop, took off at about four or 5,000 miles an hour. Oh, was he happy. So he flew back to the base, went and had a couple of drinks and a steak, had a nice, you know, nice sleep, got up in the next morning saying, boy, I dodged a, a big one there. When he was met by an intelligence officer of the United States government who informed him that he would never, ever speak of this again as long as he lived, which he proceeded to do. Until the UK, in October of last year, as part of their document release, included this file. And so one morning he gets up and gets a call from the Daily Mail in the UK saying, are you the fellow that tried to shoot down a UFO in 1957? And he goes, yeah. And after that, he gave dozens of interviews and was able to talk about it and even now cannot uh, help the breaking down. He couldn't even tell his father before he died. Milton represents, you see, the people that have been involved in this embargo. They are good people. They have done their job. They followed their orders. He was going to take this to his grave. Now he can talk about it. He called for Obama to release the UFO files. And then I followed them up. Oh, by the way, I'll get to this in a second. I followed them up. And that is when, through, through CNN, through the media, I, went, I, I called Obama and I said, look, you have got to disclose the ET presence for two very important reasons. One, if you don't do it, this embargo is going to be your embargo in a very short amount of time. It's going to be your name on it. And your whole open, transparent government initiative is going to turn to dust and be worthless. And second, if you don't disclose soon, there's a better than 50-50 chance another nation is going to do it and preempt the Americans' prerogative here and take the legacy away and leave us with nothing but the garbage to clean up and the tough questions to answer, all right? And the leading candidates for that are Russia, China, and France, all right? That was a clear message. He did not disclose. It's now 259 days, and so we keep the pressure on. We will not relent on this. Uh, and to give you a sense of why I'm optimistic, right? And I, I'm bragging here a little bit, but, but it's to make a point. That press conference was held on April the 20th, all right? The next day, we had an article in the Washington Post about that event, mentioning the, the facts on Washington, Washington, mentioning PRG's work, mentioning the X conference, mentioning disclosure, mentioning the truth embargo, mentioning Andrew Mitchell. On the same day, we also had a good article in the Washington Times, both days, the two leading papers in Washington. Same thing, mentioning Mitchell and all of the appropriate matters. All right, And then just 24 days later, in the New York Times, we have an article again on this issue, referring to all of the appropriate matters. You see, the main upper level tier of media is starting to break. They sort of know the jig is up. Right? Now, they had a few cute, cute remarks in here, but trust me, right? it took 13 years to get those kind of articles in with no money, right? operating from the internet, with, in, with cyber groups, 
right, working independently, right, with a fraction of the money that some people spend on their lawn care, right, which is why I got to talk to Robbie Williams, all right. But we were able to do it, so we can win this. We need people to help. We need people to join in. We need everyone to go to the facts on Washington.org and send a letter, fax, and email, all three, to the, the White House press corps demanding they start doing their job. I can tell you, I know this for a fact, that a letter from a foreign country that comes in to like the press corps or even the White House has twice the impact of a letter from the United States. Odd, isn't it? But not odd. You see, they think if somebody from another nation is so concerned about this that they would write us. This is a big deal, right? And so these letters really matter. So that's it. The next X conference hopefully will be April the 16th. This is a picture of what's happening. Firmly convinced that before I see you again, the disclosure of the ET presence will have happened. That technology will be on its way out the door and your future is going to change. Imagine a plant built somewhere in Denmark, drawing into a field some sort of uh, uh, energy well that we don't have access to, but the ETs do, generating kilowatts of electricity at one penny on the dollar. And so the electricity comes into your house and it costs you five bucks a month to heat it and air condition it if you need to. And then of course, suddenly, not surprisingly, Electric cars are coming on like really fast, aren't they? And they've got new batteries and everything else. Within a couple of years, they'll have batteries in those cars. It'll take it a thousand miles without a recharge. But when you do need to recharge it, you're going to plug it into your garage at that one cent on the dollar electricity. So the cost of driving your car dropped to practically nothing. And then all that money that you don't spend on those things and everybody else amounting to trillions of dollars worldwide gets to go to other stuff and a thousand other things. That's the world that's coming. Thank you for your time. I know it's been a while. I appreciate it. Thank you. So, long three hours. I'll take, I'll take questions until he can't bear it any longer or whatever, but, uh, uh, but you know, if somebody needs a DVD, I will immediately go there. But until then, if you have any questions, fire away. Any thoughts? Yes, ma'am. Do you think that um, because you believe the Obama thing is going to happen, that the government will do this whole um, disclosure thing, is it right. also, do you also believe that it's because of the that they have knowledge with regards to reverse technology and the zero point energy and stuff like that, and they have a certain amount of power, and that's why they're, this is a, one of the reasons why they'll go, to go with the disclosure. Sure. Obama is actually not going to do disclosure dissent. A president is unable to get in the secret empire, so he can't go down there and pull it out. Can't do it. Trust me, they tried. They can't do it. The people down there have decided disclosure is ready to happen. They've sort of, you know, they, they know it's in the best interest of the country. They are going to come to him and say, Barack, you're the guy, all right? And he will, of course, say yes. One of the reasons they're going to do that is because, you know, those people working down in the secret empire, the military and intelligence uh, officers and managers and careerists down there, they, they got families and spouses. They go home. They watch uh, the cable news. They know the environmental problems. They know what we're facing. And they know we have to have that tech. And there's no way they can bring the tech out and say, now, let me, let me tell you, we're announcing today we have anti-gravitic drive and zero-point energy, but it has nothing to do with extraterrestrials. They don't exist. No way. You have to end the truth embargo and then get the tech. It's that simple equation. And so, yes, it's about the tech. It's about the national security. The oil companies are now as rich as they could ever want to be. They, you know, they got so much money, it's almost pathetic. So they know the game is up. They'll take all that money and invest in the post-disclosure world and make even more money. All right, the rich will still be rich. You'll go to the work the next day. The powerful will still be powerful, but there will be realignments. And in that moment, in the post-disclosure transition, not the transition, but the post-disclosure world, with a million billion eyes, rather, focused on the world's government, with the power of the internet behind you, and Facebook and YouTube and everything else, watching it all unfold in high definition television, satellites and everything else, we will have a chance to start 
rearranging the pieces on the boards. And I think you might see that the greatest reform era in history take place in the, in the years following disclosure. Uh, as we start to correct a sort of buildup of dysfunctional, institutionalized problems, right? And not only in our country, but elsewhere. Uh, it's going to be really impressive to watch. And yes, some people are going to lose power, but not completely. And some people may lose a little money, but they'll still be fine. Some will get richer, some will get poor. But you will see a, a realignment. And the internet is our greatest asset. And every day we get better and better at using it. Another question? Hmm. Yes. Do you think that there's any chance that this uh, power, this, this technology, can be? Uh, what worries me about it is about the pit that we that Do you think there's any chance this could be misused? I of mean, course. Okay, so we're going for the truth regardless of the consequences. Right? Well, it, it's it's. Let me put it this way: the consequences of not having that technology are obvious and catastrophic. Uh, same thing with you know we had nuclear energy. We we cracked the atoms. You can make nuclear reactors, you can build bombs. We did both. Is that good? It would have been better if we hadn't built the bombs. But nevertheless, uh, we certainly have experience with dealing with dangerous technology. We should apply that so that this tech is not used uh, improperly. But if it is, it is. Uh, you know, we, we, we have a car. We have a world dependent upon cars. The United States can't live without it. How many people have cars? Probably two billion. Every day in the United States, every year in the United States, 40,000 people die from car accidents. Are we going to get rid of the cars? No. We are responsible for our world. We're responsible for ourselves and our nation, right? You elect people that will misuse power, then they will misuse it. If you elect fools, they will be foolish. If you elect immoral people, they will be immoral. The people of this world, all nations, have got to take, start taking responsibility for who they elect, how much they're willing to put up with, and what kind of world they want. There are no guarantees. But the world will go on. The Catholic Church would have preferred the Copernican Revolution to hold off a little longer. What was the chance of that? Zero. Okay? Disclosure will happen. The issue is, it is going to happen well or happen badly. And right now, it's not going well at all. All right? We have all of this power in the hands of a small group of individuals, science, uh, government scientists and careerists, who are the only ones really dealing with it. Clearly, they could weaponize it, and so the chances of it being weaponized are even greater if it remains in secret fashions than if it's at least available to the world for consideration, right? It would be the same thing as if the United States had said, we are never going to allow the nuclear technology to be used for, 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 for human good. No, no power plants, no nothing. We're only going to keep it for weapons. Imagine how that would have gone. So the world will never be without danger. We will always have those tough choices. But the one thing we know from the history of, 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 of empires and, and, and totalitarian states, you cannot build a lasting society on lies. It just will not last. The Soviet Union was built entirely on lies. And it managed a good 73 years, and it was boom, gone. Right? We have made, ma maintained, uh, we have developed an institutional lying in the United States that's now in its 62nd year. In fact, in Washington, lying is now a pastime, right? Everybody is competing to see who can lie better, right? It's institutionalized. Given the opportunity to tell the truth with good gain, people will lie anyway because they don't know how to tell the truth anymore. This is how bad it's gotten. So when you see us unable to have health care or deal with the nuclear issues or the environmental issues, when you see us running around and calling each other's communists and, and, and carrying weapons, to, you're seeing a nation that is coming unglued because it has been living in a delusion for six decades, lied to about everything. And because we've been lied about everything, we don't trust the government about anything. And so if there's a pandemic of flu and the government's trying to get some vaccine out, you've got websites devoted to the premise that the United States government is literally killing you off in order to depopulate the planet. If people fly into our buildings, the government must have flown the planes. I don't know the truth of these things. All I know is that the level of trust in the United States is, is really bad. Okay, It's really bad. And so we got 10,000 nukes, the largest economy in the world, and nobody believes a damn thing the government's saying on a day-to-day -day basis. That's not good. That's like having an enraged bull in your house on steroids running around. You know something bad is going to happen. right? 
So the concern is appropriate. That's one of the reasons we do what we do. Let's raise awareness. The issue of misuse of technology, the issue of a false flag disclosure, where they come in and say, the ETs are here and they're here to kill you. Mm -hmm. We need $2 trillion dollars today and you all need to, to sign up to be Starship Troopers. A lot of people watching for that one. They better be very persuasive, all right? Again, internet, awareness, meetings like this, thousands of them, websites, media, whatever, art bell, all of this is about raising awareness so all of you won't just spectate the most profound event in human history. You will interact with it. And when the governments start to use the old rules to, in the new world, right, saying, I tell you what, we got this incredible energy device. It makes unbelievable electricity. And guess what? We're going to build these things and we're going to knock your electricity bill down 5%, right? You know, how about that? You like that? And we go, uh-uh, I don't think so, all right? Not going to accept that. This is up to us, and we'll have to make those calls. And, and it may not go well. It may not go, it may not go well, but I, I think it will. I'm optimistic. Any other questions? Yes. Uh, well, when for complete disclosure, how do you think that it will, it will go to uh, impact on the global uh, economy? Because a lot of industries are in for a really rough time, and a lot of stocks are going to drop to basically nothing. On that, on disclosure? I think. Uh, no, let me tell you what's going to happen. Gold will go up. Oil will go down, coal will go down, natural gas will go down. Okay, so don't be short oil, long coal. Be short coal, short oil, well, long gold. These uh, <coughs> current technologies that are going to be useless. Well, you know, there are a lot of people out there that are, they've seen these saucers <coughs> and they know that something's going on and they're trying to invent stuff and you've got all these little groups trying to invent anti-gravity and everything else. I feel bad for them, they're going to be victims, but they're small. There's a, there's a small number of people, all right? The, what the government has completely wipes all that stuff away. All right, so, but I hope they enjoyed, you know, what they were doing. Let's be clear. You drop the price of energy. You, you, you bring in anti-gravitic. Look, we have film of these craft, our craft, our version of these craft, flying over some of our bases. Okay. So you take a, let me take, you take a trap, you take one, of, take one of those garbage containers, you know, those big garbage containers. <coughs> And if you can put that baby up about 300 feet and just hover it there, that's called anti-gravity, right? There is no other way to do it. You have got to literally be negating gravity. They can do that. They have already got the anti-gravity down. What we don't know is that they have the energy down, all right? But even just the anti-gravity, you can't imagine the kinds of things that could come from that, the kind of possibilities and businesses. But if you talk about a new energy source, Take a big, a, bill, a million business models, a million business plans, okay? Lay them out on a table, 10 miles long. And on any given day, 98% of those business plans won't work because the economics are not right. And one of the number, number one issues in economics is energy. You drop the price of energy 90% and another 800,000 business plans now work. All those companies are viable. You will see the greatest explosion of corporate development and business development. Corporate's a bad name now. Business development, new business, new entrepreneurism ever seen before. Hiring huge numbers of people. Other industries will be able to expand. If you're a major industry with say $120 million a year in energy costs and that drops to what, 20 million a year or 10 million or 5 million, now you got an extra 100 million dollars. And so you will see a little bit of a dip a little bit of confusion, stocks tend to drop during uncertainty, and then the lights will start going off in people's eyes, and boom, off it goes. That's what should happen, unless they pull some stupid stuff. Like take some of their nice re-engineered saucers, fly them over Memphis, and blow it up, right? And say, oh, mon dieu, the extraterrestrials blew Memphis up. Oh my god, we must go to war with them. Whatever, all right? In which case, millions of people on the internet will immediately marshal their forces and start picking that whole thing apart down to the molecule to find out if they're pulling some stupid stuff. This is the post-disclosure world. They will start out with the, the best stuff, the most uplifting stuff, the most exciting stuff. And then they'll start working in some of the less exciting stuff. The tech will come out at some point, And then down the line, after we get used to it, we'll start getting some of the more really interesting stuff and then some of the disturbing stuff. So what, five, six, seven months maybe in is when suddenly they're going to come forward and say, about those abductions, all right? You know, 
We're sorry about that. We really are. There's not a damn thing we could do about it, frankly. What could we do, right? Uh, but hopefully they're stopping, and I think they will, post-disclosure. I think yeah. all abductions will stop. But is that awkward? Yeah, it's awkward. Of course it's awkward. And people say, oh, well, we can't do that. All those upset abductees. Hey, for every one abductee, there's like a thousand just regular people. And all they're going to care about is, what more can you tell me? Glued to their television set for months, waiting to know more. What's going to happen in the world? And so it's all going to be a forward thing, right? And the issues will be backhandled, like the astronauts, the 14 that died in the wonderful shuttle, the one with the four million moving parts. What do you think the families of those astronauts are going to think when they find out they had anaerobic drive 25 years before they sent their kids up in those yeah. gliding hot plates, right? Yeah. They're going to be real angry. And they'll all get calls from the government saying, we're so sorry. We really are so sorry. National security prevented us. But we are going to be sending all of you a check for $10 million. And that will be that. And we'll move on. That's the way it will be. So get ready. And uh, I hope and enjoy you know, the post-disclosure world. I'm ready for it, I'll tell you, after 13 years. Can't happen soon enough, all right? It's my biggest fear, you know, is I'll wake up one day and there'll be a big, you know, thing in the paper saying the extraterrestrials have left. They've all gone, you know. They hung around, they're done, they're finished, they all went home. And I'm thinking, oh my God, I'm 62, I've got to get a job. <laughs> that's not good. You know, so, but I don't think that's going to happen. Folks, I think we need to let you go. If you want to do with these, I'll be right here. And uh, uh, if you want to be on my email, go to my website, any of the websites, email me and say subscribe. Or if you have a question, email me, whatever. I'll get you on the list. If, you want to, if you're on Facebook, friend up. Come be my friend, right? Uh, and, and join some of the groups, whatever, and we can communicate indefinitely. Hey, Yep. Yeah. Yeah.